Witch Hand is a 4X type card strategy game that launches today, February 7th, 2024, for the price of $11.99. You can find it on the PC, specifically Steam, and it's by John Nielsen, who you might know from another review on this channel, Mechanobots. That ended up on an overlooked games list video, but the question is, will Witch Hand be worth a spot on that list from a quality perspective? Because you don't want a game to make that list, that means it didn't sell enough. Regardless, before I begin, this key was obtained from the developer for review purposes. That won't change my opinion of the game in the end, but you should know that because of FTC guidelines, as well as the whole morals thing, you know? The object of Witch Hand is simple, stay alive as long as you can, by exploring your building and resource management options while keeping your witch alive. Your witch is the center point of your strategy, if she dies, the game is over. We've seen similar formulas in games like Stacklands and Card Survival Tropical Island in recent years, but I will admit that Witch Hand from the get-go is probably the cleanest and slickest looking. The simple yet effective artwork, along with the bold hues and color scheme, makes things easy to read and easy on the eyes. Not to say the others are necessarily bad, but there was something to this presentation and how well I was able to read the entire card field even when it was pulled back a lot. But I'll talk more about the presentation in a bit. Let's first focus on why you're probably here. The gameplay. Here's the idea. You play as one of three witches with minor differences between them, and you start the game with a set of small resources. Basically, you use either the witch or your familiars to explore through these exploration cards to get resources, which can be sold for coin to buy more exploration cards, or used in a variety of spells, creature creations, and other various tasks to help build your power to help survive even more. Very similar to other 4X games, your job is to manage your resources and your distribution of power to unlock more powerful items, research different upgrades, and deal with enemies that you come across. For example, you can summon familiars that will be helper creatures that will assist you in specific ways. For two of the three witches, they can be allies that can attack and defend against creatures which means that your witch isn't putting herself in harm's way per se. However, they also usually can gain special behaviors based on training them at specific locations. A merchant familiar, for example, can work with fairy cities to create new resources that may be unavailable in other ways. Astrologian familiars can help boost location speed and production of other resources or make things go a little bit faster. Every familiar in which has a base attack value in health, and health only regains using specific spells in most cases. To use them, or do anything in this game mind you, you'll need to drag the card over the enemy or resource you want them to interact with. Now note, this is a mouse heavy game, and there's no controller support for good reason. You just wouldn't be able to reasonably manage this with a controller. After a period of time based on an active bar, an action will be executed, whether it's going to attack the creature across from it, or perform a spell, or explore for many examples. The game starts simple, but like more 4X games, it will start adding complexity in time, and it will also give you the ability to automate certain elements of it. A good amount of that comes from villages, which can be created with beacons and a land card. These villages will have slots to put more permanent and different boons that you can take advantage of. For example, some can generate resources on a timely basis. Some allow you to create different familiar types. Some convert resources into other resources or provide benefits such as increasing the max amount of familiars you can have. Now, the game is wise in implementing these villages and balancing them with the familiars and your other cards by making their creation a bit more expensive, requiring more rare moondrop cards, which you'll get from completing quests that are given to you, or sometimes rarely found in expiration. 
The introduction of new elements are slow and incremental at first, but things will start to get complex in a hurry. And this is where I have to say that if you're unfamiliar with 4X games, you need to understand something. These games can get very management heavy. I mean, let's look at what I would call the mid game of this run here. Look at all the different resources on screen and what I'm managing. It's a lot. Now granted, I have control of that. The game allows me to pause to make strategic moves with cards and your resources. And it can go double speed if you're waiting for certain resources to be made. So I have a lot of strategy and control based on that time element. But for people who are new to the genre, this can be a lot. It can feel like you're spinning too many plates at once and you can just get lost in all the different possibilities. Which here, at first, it didn't necessarily feel like you had a lot of different choices from a perspective of game to game in terms of strategy. The way that it introduces the newer elements in the early game is very specific. You don't have a lot of branching paths in terms of the first set of upgrades, and you really have to complete most of them to get to the next tier of upgrades where there's a little bit more variety of different strategies which does happen in other 4X games, don't get me wrong, but here it felt limited in the first tier or two at first. I need warriors to deal with certain structures and get rid of them so I have more space to play, and merchants, while seeming to get me some more coin, seem to be less important at first. But as I did more runs, I started to notice that the structures that I build in particular and focused on was very important in developing my strategy, and that could have a good variety of strategies come from them. For example, Silver Sage is a resource in the game that's needed for your spells that can heal your witch and other familiars. Sure, I could let my familiars die and easily create new ones with mana and reagents, but certain familiars were also more powerful and could be gotten through events, such as Faded Familiars. My focus on putting effort into the herbalists, meaning that I had a good chunk of silver sage being produced at any one time, easily was able to cure my big guys at any point with my excess resources. Well, as long as I had the reagents, which were a problem at times because of the fact that I didn't focus on level one exploration and terrain recycling that I could have used to get them. But I also think that if I adjusted myself a little bit more, that wouldn't have been a problem. Hell, I don't think it would have been a problem if I focused on mana production and just throwing more familiars and numbers at enemies, along with upping my familiar count through familiar homes and neighborhoods. With that all said, I also do appreciate that the game also introduced enemies and different scenarios that sort of forced me to make more variety in my strategy. The fact is, if I went one way specifically, I'd run into situations where creatures like Void Spikes would happen. Yes, they have huge attack power, but they have one health. I'd rather just throw small people at them and not take my big guys and take a lot of damage from them. Yeah, I could heal them, but that's going to take a lot of resources that I don't want to waste. And that's sort of the brilliance of some of the strategy here. Yes, the game will throw some randomization at you in terms of quests and different types of enemies but it also will punish you if you try to mega focus on something. It won't necessarily hurt you in a way that will stop a run, but if you focus on something too much, you may have to sacrifice a lot of resources or different elements, even undoing some work that you did you know, up to that point to be able to get through a specific quest or a specific roadblock. Now, one thing I do wanna mention here is the playing field as a whole. The playing field is a bunch of cards, and these cards can be moved around and sometimes accidentally clicked on, but the game does give you tools to handle that. Right clicking on a location, for example, will lock that card in that spot, so it's not pushed or accidentally moved. You can also have keybinds to quick sell and delete certain spells and resources, which is especially appreciated with the bindable keys. With all that said, the space is limited at first and can be expanded with fortune tellers and all, 
but sometimes you just end up making an upgrade that just ends up being just a little bit too big. Or a trader appears, which takes up a bunch of space, and it can get a little bit weird when it comes to interactions with each other. Especially when you start making storage crates, for example. My initial thought was to put them together tightly so I could gather the resources in them and get them out when I need it. But when getting them out so tightly packed, it caused cards to... Well, just look at the screen. Not interact well with the environment. That was a learning experience, and I think that my OCD helped me a lot in this case. My want to organize and the sort of compulsiveness that goes with it. But I could see this being for others an absolute nightmare in terms of management. You could be moving things around over and over and over again, and then items keep on flying around. And especially in the sort of mid game, that can be a lot. There could be resources, you know, being created that you don't know where they're being created from. And all of a sudden you see this pile of like five crystals and you're like, wait, where did that come from? I needed those crystals, but I was waiting. Wait, hold on. What's going on over here? There is a lot that you have to keep in mind in this game. Now, I will give the game credit in the mid-late game with the idea of the magnets and nexuses, which would draw certain resources automatically to locations if you wanted. And this was a really nice and smart idea. Now, granted, the game, even before that, does try to be at least a little smart with some of its own decision making. If you plop a crystal down on a mana generator from a crystal mine, and it creates another one from that same crystal mine, it usually passes it along to the actual mana generator without you having to do anything because it needs three. It has some intelligence there, and for the most part, it does seem to make reasonable decisions. Not always the right decision, but reasonable ones. Where I think the game struggles a tiny bit though is how long a run can go. Like, I restarted a couple of times through various reasons. One being I walked away while keeping on, on 2x speed while checking dinner, and oops, I died, because your witch takes damage from all enemies left on the field after every night. There was also that natural want to restart after learning a bunch about the game and trying again. My last run is coming in at 6 hours right now, which yeah, a lot has been done. You can see that I have a lot on the screen, and I think I'm at the end game. I got a letter saying that it's like the final one, but I don't know how long it will go until I actually hit that end game. I haven't beaten the game traditionally, despite the fact that, well, I have at this point unlocked 30 out of 36 achievements and gotten that final letter. I wish the game did a tiny bit better of a job of telling you your overall objective, because at a certain point, I felt like I was running in place mostly, just waiting for something to happen. Now, of course, with a game like this, replayability is probably a huge component for those buying it. And that's where I'm mostly positive about the game, but I'm slightly torn. Like I said, I feel like there's a lot of different strategies that could work with the game and be successful. And it's great that there's some advanced settings when it comes to starting a new game with like different moon drop rates and enemy rates that you can adjust. The slight differences in each witch also plays a small part, especially the goblin type witch can, which can only attack herself. There's over 400 different cards and I haven't seen them all, but I also in some ways feel like a lot of the replayability comes down to optimization and that number go up type mentality. Can I make this work well with this combination of things? Can I build this better? Can I try this or that? I don't see a lot of overall variety when it comes to more randomization elements. Yes, you're going to get random resources from exploring, for example, but those unique events that would maybe cause other games to go in completely different directions or to cause things to be, you know, almost like a table was overturned. Here, that doesn't really happen. You can deal with a lot of things the game gives you in any sort of situation, and sometimes it feels like the game needs a little bit more chaos to it. Am I saying that it was boring? No. This is sort of my type of crack game. I mean, just look at the number of hours I have on screen here. Yes, some of those hours are leaving the game on overnight, 
but I did play a lot of this and really did enjoy it. And especially some of the presentation elements. Sure, the little poofs that happen when you make a new item, they do get old after a little bit, but they're still enjoyable. And the card artwork is, well, great. Especially the Cook's Familiars and the Goblin's Familiars. Just look at them. They are adorable. Yes, I know some people don't like frogs, my sister being one of them, but just look at them. Look at them. They are precious, and I will protect them. I will go on record for one thing, however. The game, for the most part, was stable when it came to normal play, especially in the first two-thirds of the game. But things get a little bit hairy when I start to need a lot more coins to do things or quest in the late game. I end up selling multiple stacks of things at times, especially high-value things. And if you were to say, like, create 200 coins at once in one small location, you notice that the game almost slows to the fact that I think the game almost crashed. If it's even able to place them in a reasonable way at that point, because God forbid it tries to fit them in, you'll see some seizures on screen. Lots of seizures. But on the other note, there was a point in the game where it gave me some quests that I don't think you were supposed to be able to do. It was ridiculous values that you hadn't gotten up to that point. Except I was able to do them, but not figure out how I was able to complete them. For example, at one point it asked me for 200 coins. I had a shitload of mana, so I sold a bunch of it and tried to give the person 200 coins. It wouldn't let me. It stopped at 27. Was I not supposed to be able to do it? Is that a bug? I don't know. All I know is I wasn't able to complete it despite the fact I had it. And that felt a little bit buggy slash cheap. I've talked a lot about the gameplay at this point. So for the last three or four minutes of this review, let's talk some about the presentation. Like I said, it's clean and nice to look at. And the game does some smart things with colors and line connections that makes it easy to see and understand how resources are connected without being too explicit about it. Things like the structures that allow locations to help each other have connections that don't get in the way, yet you can clearly see they are there. And the game does at points allow you to compact locations and really manage your space well, but you still are able to tell what they are. The UI in this game is pretty great, and the fact of the matter is, that's what is really necessary for a game like this to work. It has to be there and give you the information you need without getting in your way. Do I wish the character portraits or cards maybe had some more unique animations to them? Like, you do get unique effects with things like freezing a card, for example, but I also wish that maybe some of the locations internals would have shown a little bit more life to them based on what they had. Maybe the alchemist cards were a little bit gooey with the cauldron on them, for example, and if a village had three of them, it would show it in its presentation of that village. Now, it feels like nitpicking for sure, but when you're looking at the same village for most of the game, you're not getting rid of this village. It just would go a long way to make it feel like you were doing something to the village as opposed to it just being there. Sound design for the most part is clean and effective. You'll get the sounds that you'd expect from clicking and moving things and giving you the information you need. And while it never gets over the top, it's complementing the gameplay at hand. Granted, this is one of those games where sound, while helpful, doesn't really feel necessary from an enjoyment standpoint which I think the game could have done a little bit more to help it with just a tiny bit more flair. But listen and you'll hear what I'm talking about. As for the music, l listen, the music is the weakest part of the game. I'll just put it out there. And that's sort of expected. This is the type of game where you watch a video or listen to a podcast or, you know, do something else while you play. And you almost don't listen to the music. You listen to something else. It's not that the music is bad. It's just 
it's sort of there to be in the background and nothing more than that. It's only a complimentary piece, but I do admit I wish it had a little bit more variety in the long run. Just listen and you'll hear the limited of what I'm talking about. In the end, I enjoyed Witch Hand and the hours I poured into it, but I could see it also not working for everyone. Sure, there's a good amount of choices here, and it does feed the make all the things go brain, and I think it has a good variety and choices and strategies for the genre. Is it the best? I'm not sure, I don't think so. Something like Card Survival probably takes the complexity crown from it, and Stack Lands probably takes the simplicity crown from it. It's somewhere in the middle, and its long runs can start to feel never-ending at times, despite the fact that, well, I was still playing it after, you know, well, this many hours. Does it reinvent the genre? No, but it's solid and a great point to see if you like these types of games in terms of a starting point, or a solid game if you need one right now in the genre. And it's solid in most aspects across the board, and that shows in its score an 85 out of 100, making it a solid buy, unless you're hurting for cash. But that does not take into account my enhancer system, which takes the more subjective element of games and tries to match a game to you. If you fall into one of the following categories on screen strongly, add or subtract that score to the main score. If the first digit of your score changes, refer to this chart to see if the game lies in the buyability rating for you. As you can see here, there are several different types of players who will either really love this game or really hate this game. And well, that's sort of good. The fact is, is that not every game is for everyone. And this game will really be something that people will love or hate. And you just gotta figure it out if it's for you. Anyway, if you made it this far into the video, I thank you for watching. And if you have any comments about the video, leave them in the comment section below. I'm always listening to feedback. I have been playing with audio settings. It's not in this one, but it will probably be in the next one or two. I've started to look at plugins for the audio quality. I've noticed that, yeah, I think I can work with that, but I did want to get this review out. I have received a review copy for Berserk Boy, which is a Mega Man type game. You guys know how much I love Mega Man. And I'm always streaming over on Twitch. I'm still playing through Parasite Eve. I am always, you know, looking at new indie games that are coming out. The start of this year has been a little bit weak in terms of new ones that I haven't reviewed. Um, I have been catching up on some ones from last year. Anyway, if you want more content like this, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. And of course, you could always join the Discord where I will answer any questions. Anyway, that's it for now. And as always, keep on gaming.